Welcome everyone, I'm Madeline Dinono, President and CEO of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media. With me is our esteemed ASL interpreters, Ashley McHenry and Gabe Gomez. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that in Los Angeles, we are currently on the traditional lands of the Chumash peoples. I want to recognize that we are all connected with one another and that the ground beneath my feet is historically the home of indigenous peoples. So we have a full program today. Here's what's gonna happen. In a minute, you'll hear some opening remarks. You will then hear the wonderful presentation by Soroya Jacardi. Following the research, we're honored to have leading expert Anita Sarkeesian moderate a live panel discussion with industry expert, experts. And we're also gonna have time to answer your questions. So please uh, put in your questions. So now without further ado, we would love to introduce and welcome our founder and chair, two-time Academy Award winner, Gina Davis. Hello everyone. I'm so honored to be here with you all today for the release of our groundbreaking report, The Double-Edged Sword of Online Gaming an analysis of masculinity in the gaming community. This study is the first ever content analysis on a streaming platform of its kind. I wanna first start by thanking our partners at Promundo and the Oak Foundation. Your ongoing support and collaboration made this study possible. And I also wanna thank Anita Sarkeesian for her expert guidance and support. This release couldn't be more timely. Video gameplay has spiked 75% during the COVID-19 pandemic with the gaming industry earning $159.3 billion in 2020. We know video games play an important role in the lives of young people in the US and around the world. So it was important for us to understand what boys and young men are seeing and experiencing in the online gaming community as they make up 54% of the players in the US. We'll also be sharing concrete actions for parents and content creators to improve online gaming spaces for male gamers and female and non-binary gamers who also find a sense of belonging within the gaming community. Thank you again very much for being here with us today. Thanks, Gina. And now I'd like to welcome our long, long, long time partner and ally, the one and only Gary Barker, president and CEO of Promundo. Hey, Madeline. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you and Gina and the, the GDI team again, um, launching this study into the world. We're thrilled to be partnering in this way with the Gina Davis Institute on thinking about how do we achieve and promote healthy masculinity. Promundo's work focuses on male allyship. How do we engage male identified individuals as allies in the quest for gender equality and to do that in a way that also looks at racial justice and other forms of social justice. We see this study as contributing particularly to our work on promoting healthy boyhood. We launched in partnership with GDI a previous study looking at what boys and men are watching on television during times of COVID. And this is, gives us, this study gives us a link into what boys are and young men are experiencing in terms of the gaming world. Um, and we see it as part of our Global Boyhood Initiative, which is trying to engage boys at younger ages to be their connected, equitable, um, caring selves. Um, I don't want to give away any of the headlines from the study, but we stepped into this study um, wanting to go beyond the question that's often asked, which is, do video games cause harm? Do they lead to violence? Do they lead to sexism? Um, we think it's important to ask a much more nuanced question than that. We know that certainly the gaming space contributes to lots of things. It's not on its own responsible for violence and sexism and racism, but it is a space that we need to be concerned about. And as we look at this COVID moment where young men in particular, but and young women too, are spending more time online, that question becomes even more urgent. And again, as I said, we don't want to give away, I don't want to give away the headlines because Soraya will, will share those with us, but I do think it is um, we want to say two things. One, we were, we are and were disturbed by many things that we saw, which is not surprising. Um, personally, I was quite disturbed by how many of the characters who caused the most harm are white male characters. Um, as we look at what is happening in our country in terms of ongoing mass shootings, the ongoing killing of people of color by police, mostly white, we have to be concerned about what is interpreted in some um, in some gaming spaces. 
That said, and we'll also talk about the extent of sexism and the extent of other things we should be concerned about that happen in the gaming space. But at the same time, I think it's important to acknowledge how much boys and young men and young women also tell us that gaming is a place where they connect. And I think it is important that we not come in with this lens that all gaming and all video games are somehow harmful, but instead to say, how do we make a space where a healthy forms of masculinity are promoted, where we call in those versions of manhood while we also call out the harmful versions of them. And that's what we promise to do together with colleagues from, from GDI and elsewhere of using the results of this to say the gaming world exists. It's a tremendous source of connection and friendship and camaraderie and self-expression that all of us need. But how do we ensure that like the rest of the world, it's a place where all of us are free to be ourselves, we're connected, where empathy prevails over harm. Um, so that's really what we promise to take out of that. Um, I also wanna end just by saying, thanks so much to, for the research team at GDI for their work on this, Soraya and all of, all of the colleagues who did the research part of this. Thanks to Anita um, for guiding us as well with how to ask these good questions. And I also wanna thank the Promundo research team and our comms team for the contributions as well. Um, so I will stop there and I'm thrilled to hear about the, the results. So back to you, Madeline. Thank you so much, Gary. And thank you again for all of your support. And those are really sage words. You know, how can we balance empathy um, you know, over harm? So without further ado, um, it is such a privilege to welcome Soraya Giacardi, who was our former Associate Director of Research and now the current Senior Researcher at USC Annenberg Norman Lear Center, our dear friends at Norman Lear Center, to present the findings from our study. Take it away, Soraya. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. And I mean, what an amazing opening, Gary, that was fantastic. Um, so I'm so excited to talk to you about this report. And as always, I'm only gonna be able to hit the highlights. So I encourage everyone to take a look at the full findings um, and additional resources available on the website after this event. So this project started as a collaboration between the Oak Foundation, the Gina Davis Institute and Promundo. And we were really inspired by kind of bearing witness to the conversations that we're seeing happening in our society about toxic masculinity, um, and also inspired by just the growing popularity of video games. So we started out with two kind of big picture questions. One, what do boys and young men see and experience in online gaming in terms of relationships, violence, and what it means to be a man? And two, what do we know about how manhood is presented, discussed, underst and understood in the gaming community? So as you heard Gina mention earlier, um, initial reports uh, found that video game play actually spiked about 75% around the time that those global lockdown orders started to take effect. And we also saw that the gaming industry earned $159 billion in 2020, which represents a 9.3% growth from the previous year. So if anything, these questions became even more important um, you know, once we all started experiencing this pandemic. So we knew that we wanted to look at video games, but we also recognize that modern day gaming is about so much more than what you might see in one individual game. Right, um, the gaming experience is much more broad and much more interactive than that. So we decided to look at Twitch, which is the largest and most popular streaming platform of video game content. And our study had four parts. The first part was a video game content analysis. So we looked at the actual content of the video game play that was being streamed on Twitch. The second part was looking at streamers commentary. So these are the, the streamers who are playing the game. This is the commentary that they're making while they play. The third part was looking at the chat commentary, um, which is where anybody can comment. So viewers can interact with each other. They can make requests of the streamer. They can comment with the streamer. We looked at those chat comments. And then the fourth part of our study was um, a national survey of boys and young men where we were looking to gain some insights into their experiences in the gaming community. So we'll start with our major findings from the video game content itself. We saw that female characters are very underrepresented and they make up about 20.1% of all characters. Now this gap between female characters and male characters is much wider here in video games 
than what we have previously seen in film or in television. We also saw that female characters are far more likely to be sexually objectified. They're 10 times more likely to be shown in revealing clothing, and they're five times more likely to be shown as partially nude. We also saw that characters of color are underrepresented, making up 24.7% of all characters. And we saw that four in five, or 81.9% of male characters, display at least one pillar of masculinity, um, which again, this is a much higher rate than what we saw when we examined masculinity in boys television a couple of years ago. We also found that 70.5% of male characters are shown engaging in stereotypically masculine activities. But when we broke that finding down a little bit more, we actually saw that white male characters are significantly more likely um, than male characters of color to be engaging in those stereotypical behaviors. We also saw that almost half of video game characters carry a gun during gameplay. But once again, white male characters were twice as likely to carry a weapon as male characters of color. So as Gary alluded to, you know, very quickly, we're starting to see a pattern develop in how white male characters are displayed in video games. We saw that one in three male characters are shown killing at least one other human, but white male characters are actually four times as likely as male char characters of color to kill at least one other human. And when characters do enact violence, um, characters of color are twice as likely to be motivated by something like protecting society or a stranger, as opposed to motivations like personal gain or revenge. Moving on to our major findings for the streamer comments, um, we started by tracking down and narrowing it down to the top 20 streamers on Twitch, where we found that 100% of them are men, so not a lot of diversity happening there. We saw that streamers used sexist language in 37.7% of the gameplay that we looked at. Streamers also used sexually degrading language in 24.4% of gameplay. Racist language in 5.6% of gameplay. And homophobic or transphobic language in 10.1% of segments. Overall, streamers reinforced the man box or those pillars of masculinity um, in about 96.5% of all segments. Moving on to the chat comments. And again, um, this is the part where viewers, right, have a chance to interact with each other and interact with the streamer. In the chat comments, we saw that 59% um, of those chat comment segments that we looked at promoted the man box in one way or another. 97.7% um, of those segments also included violent language. 62.6% included sexist language. 91.7% included crude and or sexual language. And 37.7% of segments included racist language. And what's really interesting is we also saw that in gameplay segments where the streamers used oppressive language, we actually saw an increase in the oppressive language that we saw in the chat as well, right? So this, this has us thinking about the way in which, uh, in which streamers, right, can kind of set the tone for their particular channel. Now, it is important to point out that Twitch does have its own community guidelines and moderation tools. So the findings that you just saw are only for the comments that made it past those moderation tools. Um, and lastly, we're gonna touch on our survey results. And here you're, you're really gonna see kind of the inspiration behind what we ended up naming the study, right? The, the double-edged sword. Because what we found is that video game spaces are meaningful and important to both boys and men. Um, when it comes to younger players, one in three boys say that they feel closer to their friends when they play video games. One in three say that playing video games makes them feel less lonely. And one in four think that video games teach them how to be good friends. We saw similar thoughts among older players where a vast majority of older gamers report that video games help them to connect with their guy friends, to let their guard down, and to share their problems, their worries, and their concerns with other men. 
Overall, two thirds of gamers say that they actually feel more like their true self in gaming spaces than they do in real life. And three in four gamers say that people who do not play video games simply do not understand how meaningful these experiences can be. So again, you know, what we're seeing is that these spaces are important and they're meaningful and they, you know, can facilitate friendships and a certain level of vulnerability. But at the same time, we're seeing a lot of problematic things. So what can we do? Um, as an industry, right, we need to create playable characters that are more representative of the world around us. We need to avoid the sexualization and objectification of women. We need to boost and promote streamers from marginalized backgrounds. We also need to show male and female characters working together, right? It's not just about saving the female character or winning the female character. Um, it's also about showing men and women working together, just like men and women will be expected to work together in the real world. We also need to take moderation and reporting more seriously. And we really need to take a look at the current tools that we're using. Um, because as you saw from the chat commentary findings, for example, there are a lot of things that are getting through these moderation tools um, that we should be concerned about. We also need to think about how we can award socially responsible games developers and platforms. And what can we do as parents or as teachers or really as anybody that's working with young boys? Um, first, we need to call out harmful stereotypes when we see or hear them, whether this is on screen or in our everyday, um, you know, day to day life. We also need to talk openly about our own fears and disappointments because that is one way in which we can model healthy vulnerability for young boys. And then we need to encourage and support vulnerability when we do see that coming from boys. So for example, you wanna avoid saying things like, you know, you need to be tough or don't cry um, because even though those comments might be well-intentioned, they can have the effect of discouraging boys from opening up and being vulnerable and sharing their feelings again in the future. We also need to acknowledge and discuss the level of violence and gaming, in particular, the ways in which white men um, in video games are, are shown as kind of being hyper aggressive and hyper violent. And we also need to talk to boys about digital sportsmanship. So just like we talk to bo um, boys and our kids in general about being a good sport when they are involved in team sports or other forms of competition, we need to have the same conversations and the same types of expectations with digital sportsmanship. So I will end it here. I will pass it back to Madeline um, and I look forward to hearing from our panel. So we know, uh, thank you so much, Soraya. We know this is a lot you know, to take in and we want to you know, break this down a little bit more. So we're very, very privileged to have with us um, our esteemed colleague, Anita Sarkeesian, who is the executive director of Feminist Frequency and the Games and Online Harassment Highlight. And Anita um, has put together an, a fabulous panel uh, to discuss kind of what we can do to address these issues um, in game development, as well as being um, industry executives, business leaders. So take it away, Anita. Hello, can, uh, can all the panelists turn their cameras on please? Um, so I'm excited to be here and I'm excited about this, um, this study. I feel like it's just so rich and detailed. I highly encourage everyone to actually go read it. I know Soraya <laughs> really condensed it, but there's a lot there, especially if you're interested in um, the, the Promundo's man box scale, the pillars. I think that breaking some of that down is, is really interesting. So I encourage everyone to go, go read it. Um, we don't have a lot of time and I have some amazing panelists. So I, we're going to kind of focus the conversation a little bit on, on really on, on streaming and the cultures around streaming. But before we do that, I want to introduce the panel and who we're going to be talking to, uh, so that I don't have to read some stuffy bio. I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves. So let's start with Kishana Gray. Hi, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, I'm Dr. Keyshawn Gray. I'm an associate professor in writing rhetoric and digital studies at the University of Kentucky. Thank you all. 
Awesome. Uh, Veronica Nicotine, I don't know how you want us to address you. You let me know. Yeah, You're sure. next. Uh, Veronica or Nicotine is fine. Hi, okay. my name is Veronica Ripley, aka Nicotine. I'm a Twitch partner and ambassador on the platform. Um, I full time streamer, been streaming full time on Twitch for like three years. I've been a streamer there for five and I've been around. <laughs> you can find me on twitch.tv slash Nicotine, N I K A T I N E. Amazing. And lastly, Bijan Steven, who are you? Hi, uh, I'm Bijan. I, um, uh, that's a really good question. I'm now a podcaster. I work at a studio called Campsite Media. But before that, I was covering Twitch for The Verge for the last couple of years. Um, and I've written a lot about internet culture, online gaming, you name it. There's an article that I've written about it. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> it's not an exaggeration. <laughs> Whenever I'm like, what is happening on Twitch right now? I always hit up Bijan to explain it to me because I'm old now and don't know things. Um, but okay, so I think that doing a study around streaming is really interesting. I, there's a lot of, um, you know, we talk about streaming as this new technology. And I feel like when we talk about new technologies, it's kind of a loaded term because like streaming has been around for a while, but so it depends on the scale of what you mean by new, right? But for the context of this conversation, I am I am gonna think of it as new, especially as it's been skyrocketing lately. Um, and, you know, as this study shows, and as we anecdotally already know that the top streamers are mostly white men. Um, they're the ones that are getting most of the sponsorship money, most of like huge audience is most of the support, like institutional support from these platforms. And that really informs a lot of how these platforms are operating, right? And who's benefiting from them and who's not. So I don't know um, in the audience, how many folks here are like from gaming and familiar from gaming, how many folks are just like interested in culture things. So I wanted to kind of start um, maybe Bij, because you've done so much reporting on, on um, on streaming and really like kind of studying it in a lot of ways. Um, can you like talk briefly about the impact of streaming over the last few years in gaming specifically and how it's kind of changed the gaming landscape? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, so I, I've been, I grew up playing video games um, and I grew up playing online video games. And I think it's, it's really interesting to see streaming um, become as much of a thing as it has, because I think it's this, it, it, it started this like strange kind of wonderful feedback loop where um, it amplifies the culture around video games, but also like adds to it. Like there are lots of, um, a lot, a lot of internet culture is driven by like this ecosystem that not a lot of people necessarily know about. And I think streaming is interesting and important because um, it, it lets, games and people in interested in games talk to each other. Um, and it's, it's this really interesting feedback loop, I think. Nice. So this study is very focused on masculinity, right? It takes the mm -hmm. Permundo's man box scale and tries to figure out how, what that looks like in terms of this space. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you're familiar at all with online culture, you'll know that like there are lots of expressions of toxic masculinity that manifest in the form of online harassment and stalking and harmful behaviors that affect the gaming community. I think it's been extremely prevalent in gaming over the last, I don't know, decade or so. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested a little bit in how some of that space um, that, you know, not to be too academic about it, but how some of that internalized hegemonic masculinity is actually harming men and boys in these communities. I know, Kishana, you've done a lot of research in these spaces, specifically around communities of color. Can you talk a little bit about what that, what, what your findings have been and, and if they are, are counter to what I'm, <laughs> what I'm saying? Yeah. Absolutely. I'd, I'd love to talk about that. You know, I think, you know, you know, especially with this report, I really think it was a great update, like to give us like a sense of like the landscape of like what's happening. And I love the addition of like streaming culture. Right. I um, mean, I think one of the things that I think I got like disheartened by was that it seemed like it was like a replication of of what, you know, is already like been said, you know, like we still see all the disparities. We still see, you know, how toxic masculine masculinity, you know, like dominates the space. You know, you see the maltreatment of like, you know, minoritized and marginalized, you know, populations in those spaces. And I guess, you know, like, like for me, you know, I'm, I guess I'm waiting for that moment of like, okay, well, we know all this, like, what can we like do about it? Right. Cause even like in my own research, you know, a lot of, especially in the streaming world, you know, I, I focus a lot on, 
you know, how community is developed in those spaces, right? But I think, you know, just even thinking about right now, like with the Twitch raids that are like dominating, like, you know, like conversations like on social media right now, you know, we're like, okay, hey, stakeholders in this space, like what can folks do? How can we protect populations and protect people like in this space? Because it's happening. And then so much of the burden and the labor, you know, really falls on to like the user in the space, you know, and then, you know, the more, the mo more minoritized, like the more labor that they have to have to like, you know, combat, you know, combating racism and sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and then, you know, like folks like can't catch a break, right? You know, so I'm hoping that we can have like more like, you know, investment, like industry like investment into like, okay, what do we need to do like to solve this problem? So I'm really glad to see, you know, this report. It's an accessible report, you know, folks can look at it and kind of get like a good, you know, sense of like what the landscape, you know, is. Um, but it's also, of course, just like a microcosm of things, you know, just like, you know, you know, Dr. Barker was like talking earlier of saying, you know, we're not trying to like blame gaming and blame the gaming community for these things, you know, because it's a microcosm of what's happening, like in the real world. So a lot of my research really confirms like a lot of the stuff that that the report um, found. Yeah. Can you just explain what raids are for folks who might not be familiar with streaming? Yes. Stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe nicotine might be more equipped to do that, you know, especially if, if, if you wanted to, to, to do that. Um, because I, I like, I like for folks who are, you know, streaming like in the culture, like to really like talk about, you know, exactly sure. what's happening, especially folks who are subject to, you know, those, those kinds of harms. If you feel comfortable doing that, I Absolutely. don't Absolutely. Yeah, no, as the recipient of several, I, I'm, I'm happy to, <laughs> uh, every so often on switch, uh, which is a, a platform that is sort of built on this backbone of anonymity. Uh, every so often streamers typically marginalized, typically, uh, streamers of color or, you know, sexual minorities will experience, um, you know, in their very public way, uh, you know, while streaming, they'll experience uh, a hate raid. Uh, this has actually been going on for years. This is not an, a new development. Uh, this has been happening since raids were a thing, before that even. Um, back when I started streaming, when, when I very first started streaming, five years ago, one of the, one of the biggest ways that it would like, that would spark it would be like people coming over from YouTube and inspiring like a little hate brigade from YouTube. Um, now it's all sort of like managed off on discord and in dark little corners of discord. But basically while a streamer is live and streaming, um, they'll see an influx of normally bots. Now it's typically bots. Um, and they'll usually be posting uh, really hateful things in chat. Uh, if you can think maybe about like the worst thing that somebody could possibly say about you and then like double it and then double it again. And then it's like thousands of that comment in chat. Uh, it's, it's kind of a nightmare for your moderators to clean up. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, more than that, there's uh, a, a lot of the techniques and tools that Twitch offers streamers to um, to help mitigate this, like uh, turning on follower only mode so that only people who follow the channel can use the chat mode. Um, typically, the, these bots are sophisticated enough to do that. They'll follow first before chatting, uh, and you end up with you know a, a whole mess in your in the in the um, in the like reporting for your stream. So it's kind of yeah. a nightmare. <laughs> so, um, so you, like you, you are a professional streamer, you make a, a living out of this and a career out of this, and you have a really, um, welcoming community, right? Like, I, I think that I often get brought in to talk about how bad things are. And I think it's really important to just acknowledge that like people do this because it is a war it can be warm and welcoming that there is there are benefits and things that folks get out of it that are really positive so we don't have a lot of time to get into that and if we had a longer panel i would love us to to talk more about like why we're here <laughs> like why we put up with this shit. um but so you know to acknowledge that you have this really great and warm community that you know obviously does get infiltrated um occasionally but how despite your space, right? The community that you've spent a lot of time cultivating and, and curating, how does this larger, you know, the, the findings in the study, right? That we were talking about all of the, the ways that there are harm and toxicity in the larger streaming space. How does that impact creators like you? The, the infiltration of the space, how does that impact us? Um, I'm thinking more, well, I mean, you can answer it however you want, but I'm thinking more about like the general environment of, oh. of sort of male dominated environment, the toxicity okay, in the yeah. environment. What does that mean for you as a, as an independent smaller sure. streamer? That's actually a very good question. So as we talked about, um, the findings reported that 100% of the top, so many streamers were, were, were male. Um, that 
I think influences a lot of the culture uh, on Twitch. I believe that, um, I, I feel like if, if we're gonna try and talk about Twitch, we need to kind of like lay out exactly what Twitch means as a, as a viewer, like as somebody who enjoys Twitch. Twitch is really like the experience of being on Twitch is really something that's vastly different from something like YouTube where you're just kind of, you know, single-mindedly watching a single video and you absorb the content and that's about it. Twitch is much more interactive that way. So like, you'll be able to interact with a streamer in real time. When you're the top 10 streamers, uh, are pulling, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of viewers, it really sets a tone. It's, it's like a train conductor conducting a, a, a whole army of people who are laying down tracks in front of them. And everybody has uh, this, this veil of anonymity. So you really get to experience kind of like human beings getting to be anonymous without oversight and you really have to rely on the conductor of this experience to really set the tone for it. And if those few people at the top of the, you know, the top of the ladder are setting a tone that's like not, that's not like acceptable or like not good for, for minorities, then, then it's a problem later on down the line because all of those people who've been experiencing this, this conductor and their one way of doing things, if they start to, you know, veer off the rails a little bit, the rest of us kind of get the uh, you know the brunt of it, so it really does. We do really rely on the on the you know the top few streamers to set a a welcoming tone for the rest of us. I, I yeah. also do, I also do want to add that um, I think a lot of like this is Twitch has been around for a long time, um, even though it doesn't it maybe doesn't seem that way. Um, and the culture on early Twitch was like universally extremely toxic, I think, and. Um, some of the bigger streamers on the platform are also some of the older streamers on the platform. So you have you have this kind of like uh, effect of, I think, Twitch itself. I mean, at least when I was reporting on them um, extensively, like I think Twitch itself was trying to, you know, go mainstream and market itself to people who weren't necessarily gamers. They were promoting, you know, their arts and crafts because there's like a really wonderful, for example, maker community on Twitch. Like people just like making leather goods all day and chatting with their chat. It is great. Um, but uh, with that, like with more people coming to the site, you have people running into this sort of like dominant culture that's maybe in decline a little bit, um, which is, you know, you have these big streamers who have somewhat toxic communities that they haven't really reined in because they haven't had to. Um, and then you have those people sort of setting the tone and it really does flow downward. That said, I will say, I think um, a lot of the smaller streams, you know, like anybody, like I think in the lower parts of the, the Twitch directory, um, You'll, you'll find a lot of really wonderful people and a lot of really wonderful communities um, that are largely unaffected by like that stuff. I mean, outside of hate raids and whatnot, because I do think like um, you can tell what a streamer is like immediately from their chat. Um, and I think some, most of the time those communities don't necessarily intersect unless the streamer is feeling malicious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I so I stream um, and Feminist Frequency streams, and we have a really loving, wonderful community that very rarely gets attacked, which is which was, is contrary to what people would think, right? Um, it's not like we haven't, uh, but you know, there are there are spaces um, that that can exist. Just a yeah, um, like yeah. I stream too, and my community is great. Like they're they're it's yeah. tiny, like that's perfectly fine with me, but <laughs> yeah, same. And I, yeah. there is a, there is a level of like, once you get to a certain level of audience, it, it like the, the scale of toxicity increases with the scale of audience. Like that's just sort of a reality, especially if you're trying to be a professional in this space and you want to build an audience, but that's a different conversation that someone, not me, <laughs> I don't know about this. Um, so I, I want to talk briefly about, um, gatekeeping. So gatekeeping in gaming is a massive problem. It's a massive problem in fan communities in general, right? You get a lot of like, um, and what I mean by gatekeeping is that um, the ways in which we create, the ways in which certain communities create blockers of entry um, and the, the and some of that is great, right? If you're trying to commit, create a community for folks who are historically marginalized just for them, that kind of gatekeeping I think is okay. And we wouldn't call that gatekeeping. We would call that building community, right? What I'm talking about is the like, prove to me that you're a real gamer. And this happens mostly to marginalized folks um, of like, do you really love Star Wars? Then please explain the da 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 da. I don't really love Star Wars. I don't even know how to do an example <laughs> of that, <laughs> right? But that happens a lot in gaming. And so, I'm wondering 
what that looks like in streaming, right? What is the gatekeeping? Uh, how does that manifest specifically in this space? I think one of the one of the ways that it manifests, like um, uh, in streaming culture, is that you also have to think about how visible we are when we're streaming. Like, you know, we're there. You know, most of us like don't hide like who we are. You know, like we're, our pictures there along with like the content that we're creating right then too, right? And so I think I'm thinking about like comments and like threads. You know, where people will have like, oh, well, you know, she tried to play Fortnite. She's not really that good. Is she really like a gamer? She calls herself a gamer. Like, so there, there are like you know that that kind of like gatekeeping, but also like these 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 a, a weird metrics and these measures that people like, you know, uh, enforce, you know, really to keep like, you know, women, femme presenting folks out, you know, marginalized masculinities out, you know, folks of color out. So these are like just the ways that the dominant culture, you know, just like reinforces like those boundaries to say who's a real gamer and like who's like not a real gamer. And I think that that's, you know, of course we see that like in a, a lot of like, you know, different like arenas and field. Um, but I think it's really interesting that gaming does that because that's been, you know, you know, I don't want to call like any brand of masculinity out, you know, but I'm just thinking about like, like this brand of like geek masculinity whose spaces have always been like protected. And then they really perceive this space as like, oh, we're outsiders and we're coming in and like invading your, their space. And so they have to protect it. So they, you know, put walls up, you know, they put these boundaries up and they do this gatekeeping kind of stuff, you know, to say like, oh, here's this threshold and here's this bar and you have to meet this bar in order for us. But, but of course they keep moving the goalposts. They keep extending it and like, you know, um, expanding, you know, what it means to be a game or expanding what it means to be a streamer because they want to just have, you know, have like, you know, this protected class, you know, where, you know, folks like us really are, 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 are left out. Um, so I think, you know, it's really interesting, you know, with that, that concept of, of gatekeeping, because even think, the industry does it too, you know, I'm even thinking about, you know, folks who try to enter like the gaming industry and just like the impossible, you know, the impossible, um, um, like requirements, like to get in, you know, they want to see, you know, this kind of coding and this kind of like programming, you know, they want to see all those things, but there are like multi, a multitude of ways to like make games. But I think, you know, it's just like, you know, these folks that want to keep their elite protected spaces, like just that, you know, to keep a lot of us out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do either of you want to add to the gatekeeping question? You don't have to, but you got it. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, that's it. I know yeah. it's hard to it's hard to follow that. Cool. Um, uh, I think I'd like us to go in the direction. Oh, yeah. Can, I'm so sorry. I wanted to um, it's just just comment whenever I was listening, you know, to them, uh, uh, to to them talking earlier, and look, and then I'm, I'm gonna lose it. I I, I just lost it. I just, never mind. <laughs> never mind. I just been there. Been there. <laughs> I, interrupt again. I can listen to you talk all day. Um, okay. I want to talk about interventions in the, the last little bit that we have. So I, let's start. I'm really curious what interventions aren't working. Um, because every, like all of these social media platforms, including Twitch are like, oh shit, we got to like do stuff now. And uh, I have a long history of, <laughs> of uh, problems with the way that, that, that uh anyway whatever who cares about my opinions on this um so but but we see every so often these like big announcements that come out of these spaces being like we solved the problem or whatever or like we're going to institute the, i mean to be more practical we're going to institute this piece of tech to try and solve xyz problem right what isn't working and i will give you all an opportunity to talk about what is and what you'd like to see but i think that this is really an illuminating question about how these platforms um are are thinking about and trying to address these issues nicotine you already brought up the sort of uh introducing the follow um aspect into rating which people always get around right people always get around the rules so if y'all have some examples of that or thoughts around it uh, I actually, I would like to follow up a little bit with some of this. Um, I think there are, uh, there are a lot of different ways that Twitch could, uh, you know, could, and, and probably is working towards um, helping mitigate this, this pressing problem. I think, um, I think if there were some, some really concrete, uh, customizable ways to prevent certain users from talking in chat, like maybe those whose accounts have just been created or have been created within a certain span of time, like the last day or two. I think that would help mitigate a ton of this. Um, I think if there were better uh, tools for deciding which usernames could be created on Twitch, you know, whether or not using, you know, 18 numerical characters is a viable username maybe, or maybe usernames with horrible words in them. Um, I think there are probably a lot of upgrades to Automod that could, uh, Automod is Twitch's platform-specific moderation bot tool that every streamer has access to. 
Uh, I think if there were some specific upgrades to auto mod, I think if streamers uh, who are, Twitch has a product called Teams. I think if streamers who are on Teams together could share block lists, uh, it would be really handy. Uh, you know, being able to subscribe to someone else's ban list could be really useful in terms of mitigating these hate raids because my moderators ban all of the, you know, the, the accounts like this. And I'm sure that I'd love to share this data with other streamers, you know, who, who could be at risk. So, um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of ways that Twitch could, could help and maybe they're working on some of these ways right now. Yeah, great. Hmm. I, I have some, I have some thoughts about this. Um, <clears throat> so I, I went to TwitchCon in 2019, um, which was, I think the last in-person TwitchCon. Uh, <laughs> I was there too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, the, the thing that, so I, I interviewed the CEO of Twitch, Emmett Shear, and the thing that he said to me, I, I, I came, like I had like a, you know, just a, like an hour with him or whatever. Uh, in the super VIP partner lounge for like the people who were, you know, pulling like these big streamers who were pulling in the tens and thousands of viewers every day. Um, they had like a latte machine with an attendant staffing it and other perks. But um, when I talked to Emmett, you know, I was like, I came explicitly prepared for a conversation about moderation because I think moderation is like the backbone of the internet. And on most websites, the only way to moderate is to send a copyright strike, which is a whole, not what the system was designed for. But the thing that was very interesting that he told me was Twitch is very, and I quote, it's very explicitly not a free speech platform. Um, and he says that like, and here's, the, I have, I'm pulling up the article because I you know, obviously, you know, I have to reference my materials, but he said, I hope people can express themselves. I hope they can share their ideas, share their thoughts, but we're not a platform for free speech. We are not upholding the first amendment. That's the government's job. We're a community and communities have standards for how you have to behave inside that community. And so we think that it's not anything goes. And it's interesting because he said this in 2019 and nothing has really changed that much. Like it's a, it's a very explicitly, very, it's a very strong stance from a CEO to take, CEO of like a social media platform, one of the major websites on the internet with like that, you know, is one of the engines of internet culture online. And, you know, like not really follow through on it. And I know Twitch is building like moderation tools and whatnot. They rolled out a bit better suite of tools for moderators um, on the platform. But the thing about Twitch that is interesting and the thing that I think could probably stand to change is that Twitch is, moder Twitch is a well-moderated moderated website because every streamer has its, own, has its own, like has their own community and standards for moderation, which means that if you find, if you find yourself in the communities that are well-moderated, you're going to have a really great experience on the site. But I think Twitch could do more to roll that out across the platform. Like they're, they're, they don't really like they move very slowly and maybe that's the case of being a social media platform and having to consider all of the externalities of whatever intervention you're going to make. But I think by and large, like, you know, Emmett said this in 2019 and not materially, not a lot has changed. Yeah. Um, Kishana. Yeah. I didn't know if, if there was time, I think, you know, I'll just make it, you know, uh, make a quick comment. Um, I think one of the things that I see is that we haven't, we haven't really defined the terms and we haven't really like defined like what we're talking about, right? So whenever I talk about like toxicity to like academic folks, then I talk to toxic, you know, talk about toxicity to industry folks and then talk about toxicity with like streamers, like those like folks are coming at it and looking at it like in really like different ways. And I think that's been like one of the struggles and challenges like to address like something like, like racism, right? You know, because so many people who engage in like racist like practices online don't think that their behaviors are, are like racist, right? And so whenever there are like interventions and some people are are just like okay they put like you know uh you know they 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 put like a, a wall of them like okay that doesn't apply to me you know because they've narrowly defined you know what some of these terms are and so i think you know really as we move to towards like more like solutions you know we we throw out these terms and we have to think about okay who exactly are we talking about what's the you know who are the folks like who were impacted the most and who are the folks like who you've identified as like the offenders i don't want to sorry to use like that that cross roll term um but like but really like who are like the folks that you know need like these interventions and who need to be protected i don't think we talk enough about that you know I think we've identified like the problem and we want to move so quickly to like the solution that we haven't even really talked about how we got to the problem anyway and that's why I think that so many of the interventions aren't really working you know because we haven't really because I think a lot of us really want it to go away let's be honest like a lot you know mentioned you mentioned like some of these CEOs you know they really want a lot of these problems to just like to just go away so I think that that's not like real investment like on that back end of actually defining how do we get to that point and how can we keep it like from happening again yeah absolutely um 
you're all wonderful. <laughs> you're among my favorite people on this topic. We are going to move into Q&A, but right before we do that, I just want everyone to have an opportunity to plug your channels, plug what you're working on. Um, I want to make sure folks can find you if they liked what you had to say and want to learn more. So Kishana, do you want to talk about the 5 million books you've written? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just talk about one, you know, uh, for time. Intersectional Tech, you can Google it. You can Google my name and you can find probably Intersectional Tech like on any, any place where you uh, find a book. So I think if you're really interested in these topics and um, uh, I, I think my book will be really useful, you know, as especially in it, uh, some of the questions that folks are like asking, especially to keep some of our minoritized, you know, populations like protected and safe and really see what they've done already to protect themselves. You know, not they're not waiting for anybody to come and save them. They've done it themselves. Yeah, it's really good. I highly recommend it. Bijan, what do you want to plug? That's a really good question. Um, uh, you can find me online on Twitter at Bijan Steven or on Twitch. Same, same name at Bijan Steven. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. I have some stuff coming up uh, soon, but it's secret for now. <laughs> as a, as the content creator line, just like default line. Um, nicotine, wherever we find you. Uh, my name is Nicotine. I do a lot of, uh, I do a lot of role play and a lot of, uh, just various other variety stuff on Twitch every day at twitch.tv slash nicotine. That's N-I-K-A-T-I-N-E. Uh, I also founded Transmission Gaming. It's a Discord server for trans people. Uh, if you're trans and you want to play games with other trans people, it's transmissiongaming.org. Uh, I'm on Twitter at nicotine prime. And yeah, that's, uh, that's me. Cool. Uh, and I'm Anita Sarkeesian. I just want to plug uh, my hotline. I run uh, the Games and Online Harassment Hotline. It is for people who make or play games, streamers, esports folks, journalists, fans, um, if you need a little bit of emotional support. Uh, and you can find more about us at gameshotline.org. Don't leave, though. We're going to do a little bit of your Q&A right now. Madeline? Yeah, so I'd love to bring on Lisa Emery, who is our director of digital media, to ask some Q&A. But one of the things, you know, we have a lot of um, industry folk on the line. We have a lot of game development, some really large game development companies. So I heard about investment in tools specific to the Twitch platform, but I would like to know, you know, what do we want the big gaming companies to do? Kishana talked a lot about investment, but where, how do we invest in pipelines? How do we invest in, you know, so I'd like to like, what's the actions for the companies that have very large dollars that can fund, whether it's the game themselves or even sponsor other types of, of streamers. So I'd like to know about like, what are those types of interventions? Uh, I have one thought about this. Uh, if we're jumping straight to solutions, it is literally empower the people of color and minorities in your organization and actually do what they say. Like, this is the one thing that I've, this is, I mean, like, this is, I, this is a bigger thing, obviously, but like the diversity trap is you hire people at a low level who like fit the, fill your requirements or whatever and make you look good. Um, unless you're a certain unnamed game studio that just debuted. But like, most of the time, those people don't have any say in any, like they, they tell you things and it's like, you don't do them. And then you wonder why things are not working out and why people are mad at you all the time. Uh, and it's like, it's not just installing a chief diversity officer. It is literally having like senior executives who have actual power over the way the organization goes. You have to give up some of that. And this goes for like literally every organization. Like it's not just gaming, it's li literally everywhere. That's it. <laughs> I just, Somebody's I really best. want to plug that the games hotline along with take this is working on like intervention, like leadership training, like long-term interventions for this exact thing. So if you are actually an executive in one of these places, please hit us up because we're working on addressing this problem from a systemic long-term perspective. Yeah. It's, oh, go ahead. No, no. I mean, it's just, the other thing is like, the qualification argument. There's like a lot of people who are very qualified who may not have traditional qualifications. If they don't and they seem promising, bring them in and be like, hey, you could be the next leader of this fucking, excuse me, this team. Uh, why don't you, why don't we like give you more responsibility over time? And then you just take this over. Like, <laughs> it's. And pay them for that. Yes. Because yes. <laughs> that's the other thing. It's like having, having, paying people appropriately is, is, how to retain talent. This is, I mean, this is, these are the three things that really, sorry, this is the thing I've thought a lot about. 
That's all. <laughs> other question? Sh should we answer it too? I, I can. Get or, in are there. you going to go to Get another one, Anita? Um, I'm not running this section. <laughs> Lisa, I'm so sorry. Madeline, I'm so sorry. Oh, Lisa, you want to jump in? Lisa will curate yeah. some questions. You want to pull out some questions? Yeah, definitely. Um, um, this one, um, I definitely think is a good kind of um, transition over to, um, similarly, it says, what can the gaming industry do to keep BIPOC, LGBTQIA, and women safe um, slash help increase representation among streamers? Are there roles for other uh, stakeholders outside of the industry to act in support of these efforts? I think, I think, um, I don't, there's not malintention on behalf of these tech companies, right? These are some really cool human beings, amazing folks that actually, you know, they, they care. They're, so, you know, they're not like some evil villains, like the man that we got to take down. That's not like who, like these folks are. I think these folks really have lived in like, you know, these privileged bubble, bubbles for so long and they don't even know what struggle looks like and they don't know how to like recognize it. And they've also surrounded themselves like with folks that aren't giving them like the real, right? You know, like, you know, yes men or whatever, you know, they, they surround themselves with like, you know, these kinds of folks. And so I think that it's really important that they leave the tower for a little while and you know because you can listen twitter will tell you everything that you need to know about the failings of your company if you just go on twitter <laughs> check out some of these threads every once in a while you can go in there and you can actually see what folks are saying about your products about your goods about about ceos about the things that are happening you don't have to be shocked and surprised you know by a lawsuit like when things are like actually happening so i think if you just put your you know put your heart to the to the twitter streets and the digital media streets you know people can like let you know like what's happening but also don't be so uh offended Ended. You know, people take these things like personal. And I think that's where a lot of that, you know, folks aren't reflective enough about, of, of saying, oh, maybe I can do something. I might not be able to change everything, but under my purview, I can like do A, B, C, and D. Um, and also be transparent. Like, you know, when things are going right or when things are going wrong, like, you know, explain to folks, especially even explain to folks like when you're trying to do something. Um, but I also, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, I, I wish I could say, but I can't speak to, because I know all of us probably on here have signed NDAs of some sort. We can't say that many things. Um, but I also think that um, folks, a lot of folks don't have like the courage to do it because they don't want to be the one to step out there. You know, they don't want to be the ones to say, oh, we're just that we're, we're the queer company and they're going to lose like a whole segment of like their audience or whatever, you know, and folks just have to be like committed to like people and, you know, like think about humans. I'm going to shut up now because I know we're running out of time, but I think, you know, folks just have to have like a little courage, like to do something, um, and to be, you know, like the industry, like the, the four leader to be able to just, you know, uh, go out there and do a little bit. I do a little bit of work and not worry about the fallout. Anyone else want to add on? We're getting a lot of yeses and mm -hmm's in the chat. <laughs> so I think that everybody is definitely agreeing with you. Um, yeah, we have time for maybe like one or two more. Um, I want to ask this one, which is one of the industry action steps is create playable characters um, that are more representative. Can you unpack this a little more? How specifically can game designers move the needle uh, forward on representation without just having token characters? Uh, how can we be more diverse, representative in game design, be successful and impactful? Um, similarly, someone asked, um, in your opinion, is it better to have customizable characters so people can customize as they wish, or should we create specific um, a specific roster of diverse pre-made characters? I, I actually I have a lot of thoughts about this one. Yes, great, go. and uh, I do too. So, like, <laughs> Please. So as a child, my biggest draw to video games was being able to sort of inhabit, uh, you know, another character or another like possibility. Like as a, as a trans person, a huge part of my childhood, my formative years were spent in video games because it was possible for me to sort of live out and try on and get to experience some new different possibilities. Games are absolutely a way for us to imagine and try on these possibilities. So we're depriving ourselves if we continue to experience kind of only these same tropes and themes. I think that having opportunities for character creators and not just basic ones, but like really in-depth, involved and fun ones uh, is, is, a, is a huge plus for, uh, for anybody who wants to kind of get to have that new and interesting experience of getting to like try on a possibility. Um, so I made a whole video series about this that you can check out if you're interested <laughs> called Tropes versus what? No, what's it called? Tropes versus women in video games. I don't even know what the name of my shit, but I do want to say, um, I just want to add to this because we've been, we've been doing, 
uh, data collection at E3 every year for the last six years, except for this year. And it is showing us that the increase of female playable characters either remains steady or drops. It's never gone beyond like 12% or something last year. And every other year was like nine, two, three. So I just want to add here that like, while we have seen an increase in the conversations around representation in gaming and the importance of moving out of just white male dominated male power fantasies, like the stereotypes of those, um, we are not seeing an increase in playable female or non-binary characters. We are seeing an increase in choose your own character or a suite of character, like create your own character or a suite of characters. Now that isn't bad, it's just that is that has been the industry's response to inclusion. And to me, I think that that's a failure because we need to be telling specific stories. We need to be asking people to inhabit certain bodies and certain experiences in addition to providing character customization and um, and these like playable characters. There's a lot of reasons for this, um, which we don't have time to get into, but it's something that's been like, itching for me to talk about more because I think that this is not the solution to the problem we're talking about. It's a solution to a different problem that also needs to be addressed. So Anita, real quickly, for Anita or anybody else, um, I'm wondering if you can just give a very quick explainer on what a playable character is, right? Because this is our first video game report and we're usually using language like lead or supporting characters. The, the language is different for video games. So what exactly is a playable character? How do they differ from other characters? Sure, the playable character is the character that you play. So it's the character you control um, with the controller or keep mouse keyboard, or whatever it is. Um, an NPC, which you might hear is a non-playable character. And those are the characters that are in the world that you do not as the player control. It's, it's pretty, I mean, it's that simple. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you for asking for clarification. So I know that we are at time and with um, two minutes left, um, clearly uh, we want everyone to take a look at the study, but what we want, I'd say the pledge, the invitation that we have for all of you, aside from promoting and supporting all the fabulous experts that we had with us today, but please reach out to us. We are gonna be taking the study to the ground, so to speak. Um, we would love to present this to you. We would love to talk to you about what issues, what concerns. And also we wanna amplify the good that the industry is doing because we do know that a lot of the big companies are um, making investments, as Kishana said, in pipeline, in game development, but we really wanna hear from you. So please um, reach out to, to me, Madeline at CJane, um, or post it in the chat, we'll be following up with you. And I just wanted to say thank you. Our ASL interpreters have done heroic work. Thank you, Ashley. Um, thank you, Gabe. And I just wanna thank uh, Gary Barker again, and Promundo for their support. Thank you, the Oak Foundation for the support. And again, you, you know, I will follow Anita Sarkozyan off a cliff any day of the week. So thank you to everybody and have a great day. Thank you so much.